Welcome to this presentation. It's another in a series about the places we will visit during our cruise. My name is Don Campbell, and I'm happy to be here with you as your destination enrichment lecturer. These lectures cover a variety of materials from the culture and history of an area to what we think are must-see attractions and maybe even some local foods. Today, we're going to explore our port of call and then learn about Israel. The surrounding areas are known as the Palestine region. Let's take a look at the history of the area, discovering some of UNESCO's World Heritage Sites along the way. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization was formed in 1945. Its purpose is to contribute to peace by increasing respect for justice, the rule of law, and human rights. UNESCO makes every effort to build understanding through the protection and support of cultural diversity. UNESCO created the idea of world heritage to protect sites of outstanding universal value. In order to give you as much information as we can within our given time frame, we've chosen to limit the talk to the world heritage list. Israel has nine such sites dating from 500,000 years ago up until the present time. They'll be presented in pretty much the chronological order of their historical era. And as an added bonus, we're going to throw in some geographic features to keep you grounded. Well, oh, I'm sorry, that was pun intended. Throughout history, peace has been fragile in this volatile region. Many powers have ruled here, the Egyptians, the Persians, Babylonians, Greek, Romans, and the Islamic alike. Jerusalem is considered a holy city and an historical hub for three of the world's largest religions. Jews believe the Messiah will one day appear here. Muslims believe that Muhammad ascended to heaven from here. And Christians believe this is where Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You may be confused because of the overlap of the historic sites between these religions. We'll try to sort that out for you. But let's start by looking at a little bit of the geography of some of the most fought over land in the world, the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley is a continuation of the Great Rift Valley. You know, that's that big notch that's down in Africa. It separates the African tectonic plate from the Arabian plate. These crustal plates, located on the edge of the Dead Sea, are constantly moved by frequent earthquakes. The Dead Sea is bordered by Jordan to the east and Israel and Palestine to the west. Its surface and shores are almost 430 meters, or I guess you could say 1,400 feet below sea level. That makes it the Earth's lowest elevation on land. The Dead Sea is over 300 meters, or about 1,000 feet deep. While the River Jordan is the largest river in the area, the Dead Sea is the largest body of water. Its main tributary is the Jordan River. There are some small springs under and around the Dead Sea that form pools, and oh, there's also some quicksand pits all along its edge. The sea contains more than 35 different minerals, including magnesium, calcium, potassium, bromine, sulfur, and iodine. This odd chemistry results in the appearance of some very striking salt crystal formations. The Dead Sea is also called the Salt Sea. With 34% salinity, it's about 10 times as salty as any of the oceans. Its high salinity prevents larger aquatic organis organisms, such as fish and aquatic plants, from living there. But there are some small quantities of bacterial and microbial fungi. The water in the Dead Sea has such a high density that people can float pretty effortlessly. An unusual feature of the Dead Sea is its discharge of asphalt. You know, that's that black tarry stuff that they use to pave roads with. It comes from deep cracks beneath the sea. Now, they pop up small pebbles and even some large blocks of that black substance. Asphalt-coated figurines and some Neolithic or Stone Age skulls have been found here. The Egyptians used this asphalt that was imported from the Dead Sea region in their mummification processes. 
It has been the supplier of a wide variety of products, including cosmetics, herbal sachets, and potash for fertilizer. Hmm. Same minerals that you put on your face can be used as fertilizers? Who would have thought? And oh, by the way, these young ladies are going to have to bathe in turpentine to get that tar off them. Anyway, the earliest known inhabitants in the Palestine region were Neanderthals. Yep, that's the same crowd that was up in northern Europe. A skeleton of a Neanderthal female named Taboon is regarded as one of the most important human fossils ever found. UNESCO has listed four caves on the southern valley side of Mount Carmel. They are considered to have outstanding universal value as significant sites of human evolution. And they're just 12 kilometers or about 9 miles from Haifa. Dating back to the Paleolithic or the Old Stone Age, the Naha Mirat caves revealed archaeological findings that demonstrate the move toward agricultural life and animal husbandry. It was here that the Neanderthals and then the early anatomically modern humans transitioned from nomadic to hunter-gatherers. In other words, the caves document up to, oh, maybe a half a million years of human evolution. Many other artifacts have been found in one of the best preserved fossilized reefs on the Mediterranean, and that's pretty close by. They included a variety of flint stones, hand axes, and arrowheads. Now, on land, there were deliberate burials, skeletal material, and remains of stone houses with pits and terraces. Further archaeological investigation continues, and many more remarkable discoveries are expected in the not-too-far-distant future. Our next stop is at Megiddo, located about 35 kilometers southeast of Haifa. Megiddo is also known by the Greek name Armageddon. The book of Revelation in the Bible, uh, that's in the New Testament, mentions an ap apocalyptic battle at Armageddon. The name of the site has become synonymous with the end of the world. Today, the biblical tells of Megiddo, Hazor, and Beersheba are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Tells are historic settlement mounds. Those are kind of big things man-made or uh, alleged to be man-made. And there are over 200 of them in Israel. Megiddo was inhabited from approximately 7,000 BCE until 586 BCE. A major find from digs conducted in the 20th century there were the Megiddo stables. They are three-part structures believed to have been able to house as many as 500 horses. Excavations at Megiddo have unearthed some 26 different layers of ruins. There was a massive palace that was built here in the late Bronze Age. It also had waterworks that lead to several springs. These collection systems were created to serve a pretty dense urban community. Megiddo contains the substantial remains of towns with biblical connections, making it strongly associated with events portrayed in the Bible. Many of the remains are preserved at the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem and at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. The Canaanites came next. They were described as living, quote, by the sea and along the side of the Jordan, unquote. They built the first walled towns using rough stones and unbaked mud bricks. <clears throat> the clear boundaries of the cities and their roles as regional centers represented a new concept in communal, communal organization. As time progressed, the fortifications in these towns grew more and more complex. By the end of the early Bronze Age, some towns were even surrounded by double or triple lines of defensive walls. But the existence of the heavily fortified city walls is also evidence that this wasn't exactly a peaceful period for the Canaanites. Egyptian records speak of military intervention and raids as well as gradual decline in trade with the, un with the region. The specialized agricultural economy of the early Bronze Age Canaan finally collapsed. Alexander the Great of Macedonia conquered Palestine in 333 BCE. His successors attempted to impose Greek culture, which brought a Jewish revolt on, under the Maccabees. 
That name comes from the Hebrew word for hammer. They were said to strike hammer blows against their enemies. The Maccabees were religious conservatives who moved out of Jerusalem to escape the Greek culture. They set up a new Jewish state in 142 BCE, and that one lasted for 70 years. Mattathias, from whom they came, was created and later uh, celebrated in later Judaism as a champion of religious freedom. Next, Pompey, the Roman general, captured Palestine. Now it was ruled by the puppet kings of the Romans that were known as the Herods. The secret to the success of Herod and his ruling family were their connections to the emperors. They were master politicians, ruthless to those who threatened their power. When the Jews revolted, the Romans destroyed their temple. Jericho and Bethlehem were also destroyed, and the Jews were barred from Jerusalem itself. Our next World Heritage Site followed in the failure of the Jewish revolt against the Roman rule. A necropolis developed as a primary Jewish burial place outside of Jerusalem. The series of catacombs at Bet Sha'arim are located 20 kilometers south of the city of Haifa. The, here you can find tombs and sargophagi, a treasury of artworks and inscriptions in Greek, Aramaic, and even Hebrew. There are classical Roman architecture elements in the cave doors. Within the catacombs are dozens of menorahs and other holy Jewish objects. The cave of the coffins had 135 caskets. They were decorated with different animals that included eagles, lions, birds, and fish. And one had a curse that read, quote, whoever opens this tomb will eventually die a bad death, unquote. I don't know if there's any such thing as a good death, but I guess you could end up dying a bad one. Anyway, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, also known as Judah the Prince, is buried here. He was a key leader of the Jewish community during the Roman occupation of Judea. For centuries, the Torah had appeared only as a written text that was communicated with oral tradition. Fearing that the oral traditions might be forgotten, Judah cons consolidated the various opinions into one body of law, which became known as the Mishnah. Viet Guvrin Maresha National Park is located in central Israel. It's in the Negev Desert. That's about a two-hour drive to the south of Haifa. The main attraction here is the uh, man-made uh, chalk caves. Over the course of some 2,000 years, people used these caves as quarries, stables, granaries, and even storerooms. There were workspaces for pressing grapes and olives. They even had bird houses for doves, as well as grave sites. Archaeological artifacts unearthed at the site include a large Jewish community, a Roman Byzantine amphitheater, public baths, and some mosaics. The Iron Age is also known as the Israelite period. The Israelite period is characterized by large numbers of urban dwellings and a new local culture. The diverse archaeological findings attest to strong international links and trade relations. The abundance of writing found here indicates a broad distribution of knowledge among the common people. The incense and spice routes was a network of trade routes that flourished from the 3rd century BCE and on for about 500 years. It extended over 2,000 kilometers, transporting frankincense and myrrh from the Arabian Peninsula to the Mediterranean. It was pretty big business in southern Israel. The routes provided passage not only for frankincense and other trade goods, but also for people and ideas. The Boswellia tree is the source of an aromatic resin known as frankincense. The trees don't start to produce resin until they're oh, a little bit over eight years old. To harvest it, they are cut or stripped to cause the resin to flow. That hardens into drops that are called tears. Tapping is done up to three times a year, and the final tap generally produces the best tears. The resin is hand sorted, and quality is determined by pr uh, price is determined by quality. 
Frankincense comes in many forms, and quality is based on color, purity, aroma, age, and shape. The larger, lighter colored clumps are the most highly prized, and generally the more opaque resins are the best quality. The trees are grown in rocky soil, and that produces the most fragrant resin. Frankincense has been traded here and across Arabia and North Africa for over 5,000 years. Its demand was due to its special significance to many of the world's largest religions. It is one of the consecrated incense, uh, incenses described in the Hebrew Bible and the Talmud. The resin was burned on a special incense altar when the tabernacle was located in the first and second Jerusalem temples. Frankincense is often associated with myrrh and was one of the gifts the Magi took to the infant Jesus. Furthermore, frankincense is used as perfume and for aromatherapy. They do that by obtaining an essential oil from distilling the dry resin. It's used in traditional medicine in Asia for digestion and to get healthy skin. Yep, frankincense is edible. When used for internal consumption, it's chewed pretty much like gum, but it's much stickier. Oh, by the way, it makes a great souvenir. The four Nabataean towns of Haluza, Memshit, Avdat, and Shivda uh, have fortresses and agricultural lands in the Negev Desert. The sites date to between the 1st century BCE to the 3rd century in the Common Era. They were named UNESCO World Heritage Sites for colonizing the harsh desert with agriculture by using highly sophisticated irrigation systems. These included dams, channeling, cisterns, and reservoirs. These villages are three hours away from Haifa in the Negev Desert. But who were the Nabataeans? Well, they began migrating gradually from Arabia during the 6th century BCE. Over time, they abandoned their nomadic ways and settled in a number of places in southern Jordan. Their capital city was the legendary Petra, Jordan's most famous attraction. Sources from the Byzantine period mention both Christian and Jewish people living in the city of Biet Guvren. Of the 480 caves here, 70 are connected by quarries. Uh, the bell-shaped walls are de de decorated with Arabic inscriptions from the early Islamic period. With the carved crosses from the Byzantine Crusader era, there was some 2,000 years of activity in these caves. Nesting areas for doves are carved into the rocks. Boy, every place you go there's doves, so people must have really enjoyed some dove meat and eggs. Also of note here are the Phoenician-like burial areas consisting of about 30 interconnected caves. The caves range in size dramatically. The largest of them takes about 15 minutes to walk from one end to the other. This 1,250-acre national park at Biet Guvri was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has some 200,000 annual visitors. Located about 160 kilometers from Haifa, or just under a two-hour drive. Between 1000 and 2000 BCE, the Palestine region was ruled by the Egyptians. The Philistines, also known as the Sea People, invaded and established a powerful kingdom. The Hebrews were subject to the Philip Philistines for 200 years until they established an independent kingdom under Saul. He was succeeded by David, who was in turn succeeded by Solomon. After Solomon's reign, the kingdom broke into two states, Israel with its capital at Samaria and Judah under the house of David, and its capital was at Jerusalem. In 539 BCE, the Persians conquered the Babylonians. Under Persian rule, Palestine experienced considerable autonomy. The Jewish temple, which had previously been destroyed by the Babylonians, was rebuilt. Our next UNESCO World Heritage Site in Israel is Masada. It overlooks the Dead Sea. Herod the Great built fortified palaces for himself on Masada. Masada itself is a steep cliff that's up to 1,300 feet high in places. 
That makes the approach to the top very difficult. The siege of Masada was at the end of the First Jewish-Roman War. A group of Jewish people that were a splinter group of the Hebrew tribe of Judah heavily opposed Roman occupation. They attempted to expel the Romans from the area. Now, they were unsuccessful, and they were forced to flee Jerusalem and then settled on top of Masada. The real Roman legions surrounded the cliff. They built a wall and a siege ramp against the face of the plateau. They employed some 15,000 troops, and that included Jewish prisoners of war, to crush the resistance at Masada. Those on top threw stones at those building and constructing the ramp below, so the Romans just put the captured Jewish prisoners to work up on the ramp. The people on the top of Masada stopped killing those who built the ramp, choosing not to slaughter their fellow Jews. When the entered the forest, they discovered that its inhabitants had set all the buildings ablaze and had committed mass suicide or perhaps killed each other. The remains of two men and a full head of hair with braids belonging to a woman were found in a bathhouse. Forensic analysis shows the hair had been cut from the woman's head with a sharp instrument, and that was done while she was still alive. That was an established practice for captured women. The braids indicated that she had been married. Another 24 people were found in a cave at the base of the cliff. The rabbinical establishment concluded that they were the remains of the Jewish defenders. In 1969, they were reburied as Jews in a state ceremony. There is a new museum located at the base of Masada where you can catch the cable car. It holds, it, not the cable car, the museum, holds the artifacts that were found up on top. There's also a souvenir store that has Ava, Ava Dead Sea skin products. Uh, but then again, you can get those at Macy's. Now don't say we don't check everything out for you. Masada was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2001. It was named for its exceptional artifacts from Herod's fortresses and its symbol of those who chose death rather than slavery. Next to Jerusalem, it is the most popular destination for tourists who visit Israel. Fast forward a few hundred years to when Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity in 312 in a common era. Constantine played an influential role in the proclamation of the Edict of Milan that decreed tolerance for Christianity across the Roman Empire. He called the First Council of Nicaea, where the Nicene Creed was professed by Christians. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built on his orders at the purported site of Jesus' tomb in Jerusalem. Over the next few centuries, Palestine generally enjoyed peace and prosperity. Then it fell to Muslim Arabs by the year 640. At this time, the importance of Palestine as a holy place for Muslims was strongly emphasized. Temple Mount is considered to be one of the holiest sites in Islam. There are 11 gates uh, to get in. Ten are reserved for Muslims and one for non-Muslims. They all have guarded posts from, uh, by Israeli police in the vicinity. According to the rabbinic sages, it was from here the world expanded into its present form, where God gathered the dust used to create the first human, Adam. The area bears great significance to all three Abrahamic religions as the site of his attempt to sacrifice his son. They only differ on which son was to be sacrificed. Judaism and Christianity believe it was Isaac, and Islam endorses Ishmael. The Dome of the Rock was erected on the site of the former Temple of Solomon. In light of the dual claims of both Judaism and Islam, Temple Mount is one of the most contested religious sites in the world. In attempt to keep the status quo, the Israeli government enforces a controversial ban here on prayer by non-Muslims. Since the Crusades, the, the Muslim community has managed the site. As the mound is part of the old city, controlled by Israel since 1967, both Israel and the Palestinian Authority claim sovereignty over it. 
it remains a major focal point of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because of the ongoing struggles, this historical region, along with many others in Israel, have not been named UNESCO sites. As you can imagine, it's all pretty controversial. In the 11th century, Palestine was captured by the Crusaders. The Crusaders were fought, the Crusades themselves were fought for many reasons. One was to capture Jerusalem from the Muslims. They wanted to defend Christians in non-Christian lands. To combat paganism and heresy, the First Crusade began after a call to arms in a sermon, sermon by Pope, Pope Urban II. Acre was the port city capital of the Crusader Kingdom in Jerusalem. It is located at the northern extremity of Haifa Bay, and it sits on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Here it links waterways and commercial activity with all of the Middle East. There are major artifacts from three religions, Christianity, Muslim, and Baha'i. During the Crusades, Acre was the headquarters of the Knights of St. John the Baptist. This Catholic military order preceded the Order of Malta. Part of this fortress city was known as the Hospitaller. The Hospitallers were dedicated to John the Baptist. They were founded to provide care for sick, poor, or injured pilgrims and crusaders coming to the Holy Land. It was here that many of the knights received their medical care. The crusaders were ultimately defeated and driven out of Palestine by the Mamelukes. The Mamelukes were a class of warrior slaves who were mostly of Turkish ethnicity. Despite their origins as slaves, the Mamelukes often had higher social standing than many of the freeborn people. Acre today you, uh, is where you can see an underground passage that was built in order to reach the port during Muslim attacks. They are preserved under the citadel, the mosque, and a bath, and the prime art of their prime artifacts from the Ottoman era. Under Mameluke rule, Palestine started to decline, actually declined quite a bit. Acre is the holiest site of the Baha'i faith. There are probably more than 5 million Baha'i around the world in more than 200 ter territories and countries. That faith was founded by Baha'u'llah in the 19th century Persia. He was exiled for his teachings, and he died near Haifa while officially still a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire. His son spread the religion to Iran where it suffered intense persecution. The leadership of the Baha'i community evolved from a single individual into an administrative order. Today it's run by elected bodies and some appointed individuals. In the Baha'i faith, religious history is seen as a series of divine messengers. These messengers included Ab Abrahamic figures such as Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, as well as figures from Indian religions like Krishna and the Buddha. Baha'i says each brought a message that was suited to the needs of the time and to the capacity of the people. Each consecutive messenger prophesies the messengers to follow. The Baha'i believe that there is only one God who is the source of all creation, that all major religions have the same spiritual source and come from the same God, and that all humans have been created equal. They believe that the diversity of race and culture are seen as worthy of appreciation and acceptance. According to the teachings, the human purpose is to know and love God through prayer, reflection, and being of service to humanity. Humanity is understood to be in a process of collective evolution. The need of the present time is for the establishment of peace, justice, and unity on a global scale. On the northwest side of Mount Carmel, near Haifa, is a sacred place for Baha'i around the world. Here you can find the World Center and the Shrine of the Bab. The shrine contains the remains of the founder of Babism. He was executed in Persia in 1850. His remains were brought here to Haifa in 1909. 
The shrine is a six-room mausoleum made of local stone. Its golden dome was completed over the mausoleum in 1953. The white marble that was used came from the same ancient source that most of the Athenian masterpieces came from. The administrative headquarters of the faith were constructed adjacent to the decorative terraces and are referred to as the Ark. That shrine is so impressive it was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The White City of Tel Aviv refers to a collection of over 4,000 buildings. UNESCO cites it for being an outstanding example of new town planning. It was recognized for the cultural, climatic, and local traditions of the city. In celebration of Tel Aviv's 75th anniversary back in 1984, there was an exhibition entitled White City. Its subtitle says, quote, International Style Architecture in Israel, Portrait of an Era, unquote. Some sources trace the origin from the term of the term White City to that ex exhibition. The buildings were designed in the 1930s by German Jewish architects. They had immigrated to the then British Mandate of Palestine after the rise of the Nazis in Germany. It's called Bauhaus or International Style. Bauhaus principles emphasize functionality and inexpensive building materials. This presentation will repeat on your stateroom television, uh, Channel 8. Again, my name is Don Campbell, and I'm on this voyage with you as your destination uh, enrichment lecturer. Anytime you meet Susie or me around the ship, feel free to stop to ask questions or chat about this or any of my presentations. We always enjoy meeting and talking to people. And be sure to watch for announcements of future presentations in your evening currents. I usually can be found out in baristas, and uh, I thank you for watching today. Thank you.